Okay. Because it'll just be easier on your eyes to see this. Hi. Can I say something or no? Yeah. Oh, cool. Okay, I want to get started by just telling you who I am. Uh, my name is Mary Kirby Diaz, and I am a sociologist. I'm retired, but the sociology is still a part of my life. When I um, was active as a sociologist, I taught at the college at Farmingdale uh, in the sociology department. Uh, I taught urban, I taught communities, I taught family and marriage for almost 30 years. Um, I was a department chair. I was the head of a program called, which no longer exists, called the Undeclared, which helped um, when I was the chair of the Undeclared, I worked with about 2,500 students over a period of three years, helping them find out what they want to major in, what did they want to do for a living? What did they want to do with their lives? I used to tell my students, um, I'm here to help guide you to the, the meantime, between the time you leave college and the time you retire. And um, okay, so then I went back to research and teaching. And when I went back, I went back with a different focus. I went back looking at pop culture and uh, it turned out those were the topics that the students were interested in. I taught movies and music, pop music. I taught fashion. I taught uh, television. Uh, there's a bug floating around. I taught television. I taught uh, audiences and fandoms. And my last, the last book I wrote before I retired was on the subject of internet fandoms, which today are, are have blossomed all, all over the place. Uh, what kind of books? I wrote a family research manual. I wrote a research manual teaching students how to do research on marriage, case studies. I wrote a research guide for volunteers. And uh, the last book was the one on uh, TV audiences and fandoms. So when the farm to table movement started back around 2010, I started to look at a new fandom called the Locobors. Um, okay, I just wanna turn the light out because I think you can see the slides better. Okay, so now that you know a little bit about me, I do want to give you, um, a, a brief overview. I look at locavores as a fandom. I look at them as a group of people who have something in common that they're very passionate about. The most popular pictures on Pinterest and Instagram have to do with food. And why wouldn't it? We all love food. In fact, Photographs of food that are posted online and they're posted in magazines like Better Homes and Gardens, Family Circle, Red Book, et cetera, are pictures of food to the point where food fans refer to like a picture of a delicious chocolate cake or a wonderful omelet as food porn. So we know from this that, well, there are a lot of fans of food out there. And um, there are all kinds of fans of food. I remember uh, one, of, one of my daughter's dogs, uh, Roger. I remember every time I would put my apron on, Roger would scoot across the room, slide on his little behind to try to get between my feet so that any little drops of food that fell on the floor would be automatically his. At the same time, I would notice that my son-in-law, my daughter, and my husband 
would suddenly come in from wherever room they were at and they'd say, what's for dinner? So food, I know, is important. It's very important. Um, everybody eats. So everybody is a fan and that's how fandoms evolve. What people are into today is not just food, but eating healthy. And what eating healthy means today in 2022 isn't what it meant when I was growing up in the 50s and 60s and to some extent the 70s even. Healthy food now has a kind of different look to it. I can remember growing up, the food had a lot of butter in it, had a lot of salt, might even have had MSG. Today, we don't want those things in our food. We want a more clean taste, okay? Uh, so the local boar movement means that you eat local. Boar meaning eat and loca meaning local, not local, loca. Uh, local businesses and smaller brands are benefiting from post-pandemic consumer patterns and trends. The pandemic created a demand for local shopping, shopping you could trust, okay? Um, On-demand eating and uh, many consumers are deepening their ties to Amazon, to global food, but at the same time, other people are doing home gardens, some women are back to home canning, just like my grandmother used to do and my mother used to do. Personal and family health, according to one study, a, a huge study, found that the top three concerns people have are personal health, which means, which includes what you eat, family and friends health, and economic security. So the locavore movement kind of reflects that. One of the things the study also found is that people are doing more home baking and more home cooking rather than eating out. Long Island used to be takeout city, but people aren't taking out as much as they, as they used to. Uh, the study also found, by the way, the study was done uh, by a company called Accenture. Accenture is a huge company. They have over 700,000 employees. They have 7,000 clients, uh, retail food and business clients in over 120 countries. Uh, and they work with, out of the top Fortune 100, they work with 89 of the, those companies. They found that consumers are have become more conscious friendly, sustainable, and ethical purchases. So where does that lead us? That leads us to look at the locavore movement, to look at, and I'm going to, see if I can turn that light out. Yeah, I want you to be able to see the slides. One of the things, hmm? you can see them? You can all see them? Okay. One of the things that I'm very cognizant of, um, when I do presentations is I wear two hearing aids and I know that there are many people who need hearing aids, but they can't afford them. Um, so I tend to put more text just in case I wanna make sure people can hear me. Anyway, so when we think about locavores, we think about these beautiful displays of fresh fruit and fresh produce. This presentation has five parts. Information gathering, a taste of locavoring, becoming a fan, the birth of the movement, and some conclusions. And again, this photo was taken at a farmer's market with a wonderful display. Remember I was saying you know, a lot of zucchinis, a lot of big display of zucchinis and uh, uh, melons and lettuces. And then uh, off to the side, uh, I think the potatoes, I'm not sure. I can't see from here. Okay, most of the time when we buy our food, 
what we don't realize, or we don't think about it, is the distance the food has traveled. What we found is that food travels, most food that we buy in the supermarket, it goes from the farm, then travels by freight, which can be truck or train or plane or a combination of all of those to a processing plant or to a manufacturer. Then it goes to the market. Then it goes to the consumer. The average meal that we eat in the United States, in a, any meal that we eat, travels about 1,500 miles. That's a long distance with a lot of different hands touching the food. And it doesn't matter whether it's lettuce that comes from Chico, California, or whether it's frozen fish that comes from Seattle or, or lobster from Maine, or whether you're talking about lettuce maybe coming in from the Midwest or corn coming uh, from the Midwest where it's frozen. And then you open the little bag and here's the corn tasting really good, but it's traveled about 1,500 miles. Farm to table food purchasing travels less. It goes from the farm to a farmer's market or a market like um, maybe Fresh Farm or Whole Foods or a North Shore Farm right across the street to the consumer. Or you can go right to the farm stand, buy it and take it home. But farm to table average is no more than 400 miles. In other words, one half day's trip by truck. Beyond 400 miles, food's not considered local. So you have to remember too that the cost of our food increases with the cost of transportation. So, you know, as the cost of transportation increases, food of course is gonna cost more. It has to, it, it has to. So. It's a good idea, actually, these days to try to save money in some way um, to shave off that cost. The farm-to-table movement is a social movement. It's about growing local, buying local, and eating local. And nutritionists tell us that it is best to eat locally grown foods and locally produced food products. It results in healthier eating increased social capital. That means that we talk to each other. We get to know who the people are that are selling our food to us. We form bonds with people. Social capital isn't money in the bank, but it's like money in the bank. It's like having friends. It's like knowing that, it's like when you go to the local, the local pharmacy and you know the pharmacist. You know, if you've been going there a few years, he or she knows you, you know them. And you can have a conversation with them. You can ask them questions and trust their answers. That's what social capital does. It's not money in the bank. It's like money in your heart, okay? And that's one of the things that, that um, farm to table does is it builds social capital. It also increases community economic support. You know, you're buying stuff uh, from the food stand, the farm stand that is on 111, uh, that is just north of the expressway because, you know, that's run by the Hirsch family. And the Hirsches, they grew up in Hop Hop. And you know them. And that's where you get your tomatoes and your, no, I know it doesn't exist anymore. They're selling it. But, you know, I can remember um, when we first moved to Hop Hog, which was way over 40 years ago, we used to go to the Hirsch farm stand. And then right next door, there was a little ice cream stand and that somebody else in the Hirsch family owned it. And then our daughter went to school with somebody who was a Hirsch. And so you have that whole community support network going on. So locally grown processed food, even though you're talking about a 400 mile limit most of the time. 
if you're eating locally grown or locally processed food, it's no more than 100 to 250 miles away from home. It's like there's a farm out on the East End called Song Lee's. They make the absolutely, totally best pickles. You know, now you're talking to somebody who grew up in an area that was predominated by people who were from Eastern Europe. They were Polish, they were Ukrainian, they were Slovenian, et cetera. They were from Eastern Europe. And so those foods that you would eat a lot were things like pickles. So I know my pickles. Song Lee's are good. They're, they're, as, they're as good, if not better, than any pickles I ever ate in Pennsylvania. And just as good as the pickles we used to get when we lived in Buffalo, which has a very large Eastern European population. So locally grown food, that's worth the trip. It's a serious commitment to support local agriculture. Like, well, I always get my, my goat cheese from Catapano Farm. Yes, I have to drive. I have to drive for 45 minutes to get there but it doesn't taste like the one in the supermarket. It does taste better. And I know the people there. I've seen the goats. I've played with the goats. Capital, right? That social capital, that feeling. So a local boy is somebody that buys from local farmers, from farmers market sellers, also that are part of what's called a CSA, a community supported agriculture. A lot of people sign up for CSA baskets. And a CSA basket about is about the size, it's about the size of, of a good cooler that you might keep outside the day you might of a barbecue. And it comes every week and it has an assortment of fresh fruits and vegetables. And usually it's delivered to your house. It can cost a lot, but nothing tastes like it. If you're really into cooking and you're really a foodie. Also, locavores will even do this for coffee and chocolate and tea and spices. Uh, one of, example of being a locavore is driving on the expressway out to exit, in rather, in to exit 50. Turning around getting back on the expressway and stopping at the rest area to go into the shop and to buy the products that are made in New York State. Everything from New York State maple syrup to New York State uh, jams and jellies and uh, coffee and a whole assortment of products. The term locavore comes from uh, Jessica Prentice. She created the term in 2004. And then in, when the um, Oxford English Dictionary brought their next edition out in 2007, it had the word locavore in it and it called it the word of the year. So uh, it's a movement that's been growing since at least 2004, 2005, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, it's the it's the New York State rest area. That that rest area on the on the expressway, um, you can't access it from from the um, western. You have to be traveling east, so you have to get off, come around, and go back. But they have all kinds of wonderful products that are all from uh, New York State. Um, there's um, there's a, a um, a hot pepper jam made by a company up in Rochester called Black Crow. And it's really, really good. Um, it's very good for cooking. It's very good as a condiment to add, say with um, cold ham or beef or chicken, but it is pricey. Uh, I don't think there is. Is there a sign? Yeah. Yes. 
They don't. I don't. I don't think I've ever seen it advertised. Yeah, yeah. I don't think they've ever they've ever advertised it, except maybe an article in the newspaper before they opened. I think that that was about it. But it it's open every day. It's open every day. Yeah, it, it it opened about well new. It opened about eight eight ten years, no. eight years. When did that open? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Was that during the pandemic? No. Oh, huh. Yeah, I don't know. Um, I'm not sure, but maybe, maybe Google New York, um, maybe Google uh, LIE rest area, and maybe that might might give you times. Yeah, <clears throat> I don't know. Late at night. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. 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 Anyway, eating and cooking locavore from farm to table has been called a new wave of dining. Now that was 10 years ago, but it's still true. It's it's even exploded beyond that. Um, and I found that people who are locavores, they really have four goals. The first goal is they want good food. They want a great environment. They don't want to have to think about pollution or environmental issues. They want to build a strong community. And they also believe in sustainable farming and soil practices. Those are their four goals. And there are real health benefits. Tim Lang and Jules Pretty, of, uh, who, are, who are English, they were at the University of Essex and with the City University in the UK, were interviewed by the BBC on the subjects of food selling, food producing, and sustainability. They reported that eating local food rather than supermarket food is better for air quality and pollution, better even than eating organic food. Why? Because any food that is shipped more than 100 to 250 miles from where it's grown generates some kind of environmental damage. Uh, Lang said that road miles create more environmental damage than air miles even. And they recommend that consumers regard their food choices as ethical decisions that have repercussions on the local community and the global uh, ecology. Alyssa Crittenden, who she is an anthropologist at the University of Nevada, and she studies, uh, her, her uh, skill set is incredible. Uh, in addition to uh, like, anthropologists having a mastery of human anatomy and physiology, she is also trained in nutrition and food science. She says most people don't realize that, that uh, most of the meat we eat isn't grass-fed. It's grain-fed. Animals, uh, what makes a good piece of meat really good has a lot to do with what the animal ate. And uh, animals like cows, for example, are, design, are, are designed, are evolved to range. They like to move around, they like to eat grass. And then uh, what the farmers do, or ranchers do, is they'll move the animal from <clears throat> this part of, the, of their range to this part, they rotate them from section to section so that the animals don't overeat the grass in one area and so that they get a little exercise. They build up a little muscle, you know, those nice tender muscles 
that after we've cooked them taste so good. Uh, modern day ranchers don't really allow their animals to range and eat grass. They pretty much put the animal in one place behind a trough, feed them with grain that's mixed with steroids and antibiotics, and sometimes even animal parts. Remember mad cow, Remember what mad cow disease is? That's a disease that cows get because mixed in with the grain they've been eating are bits of cow, okay? Also, most Americans eat aged beef. Our, our meat is aged. Whereas in the rest of the world, when people eat meat, they eat meat that is fresh butchered, you know, butchered within a day or so before they, they eat it. So, but Americans like aged beef. That's what we seem to be um, into. Um, there's a different a difference in the taste between an animal that is uh, range fed and an animal that's been stuck in a trough. There's a difference in the taste between aged meat and fresh meat, and locavores are very good at telling the difference. Um, I'm sorry. Well, which is healthier depends on on the nutritionist. For many nutritionists, if they can just get their their clients to eat uh, meat that is lean, they feel that's an accomplishment. But the healthier meat is the the animal that's been range fed, been fed on grass rather than grain. Uh, why? Because grass is what they normally, what they would be eating in the wild, so to speak. Okay, did you know eating locally grown food uses four to 17 gallons less petroleum just for the cost of transportation? Locally grown food is sold, purchased, and consumed in less time than going from the farm to the, through that 1500 mile thing and is fresher than conventionally purchased food. So what are we talking about here? We're talking about vegetables, herbs, fruit, seafood, fish, meat, poultry, pork, lamb, eggs, cattle and dairy products. Cattle dairy, which means milk, cheese, butter, yogurt, and so on. And then goats and sh uh, sheep which means they're uh, cheeses, uh, goat's milk, that type of thing, baked goods, coffee, tea, spices from local processing uh, companies, even candles and soaps. The, um, the little, a little fresher. And the idea is that you're, you're purchasing something that's produced locally. So you're helping somebody local that has a business. Uh, one of the things that, um, one of my pet peeves is I hate going into a store and seeing a self-serve uh, register. To me, every self-serve register means at least three people out of a job. And uh, that's, that's what I have against them, is uh, I, like, I like to see everybody working who wants to work. Um, and, uh, one of the things that, that, that happens in life, I think is, as you go through life is, is you see, um, what happens as businesses get automated, as, uh, plants and factories get automated, as stores get automated, you see fewer and fewer real people and fewer and fewer real people to me means fewer and fewer real people that are working, that, that are contributing to the community, that are building their own social capital and social capital with us, that are um, contributing to society. So um, that's, that's my pet peeve. Um, Don Hall is the director of Transitions Sarasota in uh, Florida. And he's the coordinator of a group called Eat Local Week. Which, which they do, uh, they have one week every year in Sarasota where, where they really put a push for everybody to eat local. And he said, oil is embedded in every aspect of our society. 
It's at peak right now. The irony is he said that in 2011. When gasoline was what, $2 a gallon, $1.50 a gallon versus uh, now. He said, it doesn't mean the oil is gone, but it does mean we're at the maximum point of production. We need to find a way to get off fossil fuels. And one place where fossil fuels are deeply involved is in the food system. What do we do when fossil fuels run out? We're not going to be farming thousand acre monocultures like agribusiness with a rake and a hoe. Nobody uses rakes and hoes these days. What people use is the combines, tractors. They have a tractor and then atta attached to the back of the tractor, they have something the width of this room that goes through the, through the farm and it plows, it seeds, it irrigates, it fertilizes, it waters, it does everything but the kitchen sink. And it's run on fossil fuels. Locavoring means more money for the community. There was a study done by Brian Hallweil, who is um, an economist. And in an article that he wrote in 2004, he, was, he found in his research that every dollar you spend locally generates $2 for the local economy. So I thought, well, what's $2 in 2022? $2 in 2022 is $3.14. So for every penny you spend locally, you're generating, uh, you know, three dollars and thirteen cents more in the local economy. When businesses are not locally owned, money leaves the community. Local money helps the local economy and then helps the local community. The money stays local. The jobs stay local. So. Locavoring fans say that locavoring supports local businesses. It supports local food producers. It creates a circle of food production and food consumption. And you connect with other people in your community who also support local businesses. You're in essence building your community. But one of the things I found amongst locavores is there's a hidden side. It's not all roses and fresh baked bread and a fresh salad. It's not always good. It can encourage a them versus us attitude where people, people might say, well, I'm only gonna buy at this farm stand. I'm not gonna go out to the East End because I don't wanna help them. I wanna help the people around here. It can buttress that attitude. It can discourage you innovating uh, what you eat. In other words, uh, you might say, well, I don't want to eat that because it's not grown locally. I only want to eat what's grown locally. So you might not try something new. It can discourage uh, in favor of eating the same old, same old. It can be seen as isolationist and parochial, you know, as in, well, you know, my parents, they only eat what's grown local. They're missing all this great Thai food. So you might, you might hear that from the kids. It can encourage and support that isolationism, and it can encourage the local regional idea to the extreme. And it can encourage people to be alienated from larger and global issues. So one of the things that happens with locavores is they always have to remember that balance, that they're balancing local interests with global. And, you know, to keep that in mind, the true locavore believes and is strongly committed to the concept of growing, buying, eating, and supporting their local community businesses. Many chefs are specializing in cooking locavore to the point where many chefs buy their own farms in order to grow the food they use in their restaurants. And then food that's not from their own farms is those purchases are supplemented. Sylvia McCullough, who is shown there, um, uh, who is the chef and the co-owner of a restaurant in Oakland, California, said that to me, this is all about respecting the farmer, the love they have for what they do. 
It's about how I pour my heart into cooking and how my customers care so deeply about supporting their community. I see us all as one big chain of passion and pride coming together. Very romantic concept of a restaurant too. So fandoms are all about behaving, believing and belonging uh, in a person, a place or a thing that has special meaning for them. So the behaving part of the locavore is they, we look at their norms. And the, the big thing is they, behaving is the food is locally grown, locally sold. And they're purchasing and eating locally grown, locally um, um, purchased food. It reaffirms their belief. As far as belonging is concerned, I found that they're less likely to be alienated. They have a greater sense of community they support the local community, the local economy. They are very much aware they're building social capital and they have a belief in the community. They believe in the rightness of what they're doing. It's when you get a good solid fandom, uh, what I've, and I've been studying fandom since 2003. What I've learned is that people in a fandom have a, it's almost a religious belief. They have a very strong belief um, in what they're doing. And um, they have very, very strong belief in it. And it doesn't matter. It doesn't. And I've studied, I've studied sneaker, sneaker collectors, too. It doesn't matter whether they're collecting sneakers or they're uh, fans of a show on TV or they're locavores, or they're fans of a particular uh, team, they have a very strong commitment and belief to that fandom. You know, you see a lot of uh, sports fans are so strong in their, their love of the team that when the team plays, if they cannot be at that stadium, they have their favorite shirt, put that shirt on, their lucky shirt, so the team wins. And they'll, they'll put the uh, makeup on their face that goes with the team colors. And they have their food in front of them. And that's it. Now, it's like a religious thing. They're, they're ready to watch. And if their team doesn't win, they're just heartbroken. And so it doesn't matter what people are fans of. You know, there's that believing, behaving, belonging aspect that um, sociologists first looked at in the 1800s, um, looking at the, the first studies that were done of uh, and the word called fans in those days, by any means, um, just believers. So a locavore is also a kind of a fan. It's a person who feels passionate about a particular person, place, or thing. They are fans of local farmers and food suppliers. They are committed to finding, buying, preparing, and eating food that is locally grown. They are passionate and enthusiastic about it. They believe that by purchasing and eating their locally grown food, they are eating healthy, but uh, eating healthier, but they're helping their neighbors and they're helping their communities to flourish. Uh, they support small businesses. A Long Island locavore, for example, will purchase food grown from Long Island, the southern part of the Hudson River Valley, and northern New Jersey. Once you get past that like 200 mile radius, only on a special occasions would they really be interested um, in, in something from further away. They are a subculture, is what we, we say. They like to keep these local businesses operating. Farmers, ranchers, farmers markets, artisanal bakers, small scale uh, local businesses, small scale canners and confectioners, uh, even small, small business artists. Um, I noticed uh, when, when we go to the, um, there's a, a farmer's market in Setauka, which I think right now is in my personal opinion, right now, it's the best farmer's market going. It runs on Sundays in uh, Setauket. 
on uh, uh, right off the main road on North Road. And uh, I noticed that that there's a confectioner there who makes, um, oh, she makes fudge. I was never, you can ask my husband, I was never a big liker of fudge, except her fudge. They tell you, don't chew it. They even tell you how to eat it. They give you a little spoon and they tell you, you know, when you buy their fudge, you get little spoons and they tell you, put it on the tip of your tongue. Don't chew it. Just let it melt. When you do, it's like, oh, I may have discovered something here. So, I mean, even small scale confectioners, and there's always a line. Where does that line go? Oh, that's for the fudge. You know, where is that line going? Oh, that's the line for 4G Farm, you know. Um, so, uh, locavores are a community of like interested people. They do interact with each other. It is face to face, but they, they talk to each other through the internet. They are not interested in why we eat. The psychologists will tell us why we eat. And I'm not interested in why people eat because uh, I'm not a psychologist, but I am a sociologist. And as such, I'm interested in where people buy what they eat. Um, and they, locavores, believe the closer it's grown to where they live, the healthier it is. They are, um, they know the names. They know the names of all the farmers. They can tell, they will tell you, oh, well, um, this confection stand is really good, but there's, there's one over at um, the Setauket Farmer's Market. That one's better. Or they'll tell you, well, you know, his, his lettuce is good, but you know, 4G over at, at the Setauket Farmer's Market, that's the place. So you can talk to them. They know, they know all the farmers' markets. They know all the farmers. They know all the businesses, and they can tell you. Uh, it, it's amazing uh, the information. At the same time, we have to take into account current events. This photo was taken at the Islip Farmers Market in the summer of 2013. looks like a happening place as my students would say this is oh man this place is busy they're selling everything they have flowers and they have uh, um, fresh ravioli and all kinds of wonderful things oh my goodness oh look at this 2013 the islip farmers market moved to the grange and even though it's, it's in Sayville, it's still called the Islip Farmer's Market. This is it last summer. What the heck happened? What the heck happened? This center area used to be filled with stands. Now, to make it look bigger, they've put the stands around the perimeter. The pandemic. Lest you think that's happening everywhere, this is Setauket this summer. You go to the Setauket Farmer's Market, they have music playing, live music. They also have a radio, they have a radio station that broadcasts from the Farmer's Market. They have live music. Uh, this gentleman here is actually a, uh, a town historian. And if you stop by and talk with him for a little, you needn't buy anything. But if you just stop and talk with him a little, you find out the history of Setauket. And he goes, he, he will spend, he can spend hours telling you all about Setauket history. He'll talk about the, the, um, the cow, what was it called? The, uh, the, spy, the spy group that we had during the Revolutionary War. I think it was the at the Cowper Spy Network. Uh, he talks about uh, slavery during uh, that time frame, uh, talks about the revolution, talks about the early settlers, the indigenous people that lived here. I mean, the guy is the most incredible teacher. And he has all of this knowledge and he's just there. You know, he's there. He represents the, the historical society. 
which is the building right right next to him. And uh, that's the kind of social capital local boys love to. They love to build on the, the social capital and, and learn more. But you can see how vibrant a place this the talk at farmer's market is. I mean, I'm very prejudiced in favor of it because it's such a lively place to go and, and, uh, and shop. And of course, uh, anyone who's uh, been out toward the East End knows knows about the, the Blue Duck Bakery. Anybody here not know about the Blue Duck Bakery? Blue Duck Bakery is a, an artisanal bakery that's based out in Riverhead. And uh, they make uh, all kinds of breads and uh, they make tr they make treats too, but their their artisanal breads are really quite something. Um, so since the pandemic, some farmers markets like the one in Setauket are flourishing. Others are just hanging on. What happened during the pandemic? Well, number one, there was a saturated market. There were too many farmers markets. And so buyers voted with their feet. The second thing is a lot of farmers have been building up their farm stands. They save money that way. They don't have to spend any money on transportation. They're selling out of their farm rather than um, at a market. The third is that kitchen gardens have become popular again. One of the things I found, I, I contacted a few seed suppliers. Just, I don't have a garden, but I wanted to see what was happening. And uh, what I found out is that the um, people who are uh, selling seeds can't keep up with the demand anymore. Uh, during the farmers mar during the pandemic, people did not want to touch things because nobody knew in the beginning. Remember, it took about six to eight months before anybody knew what was causing the pandemic. How did it spread? Nobody knew. And so the first six to eight months of the pandemic, you know, we were all doing the same thing. We'd go to the market, we'd bring food home, we'd wash it. We'd wash our hands, we'd wash the jars, we'd wash the can. We were going crazy because we didn't know what caused it. We didn't know that it was it was spread like an, an ordinary flu. Okay. So um, during the pandemic, farmers markets, they're not, you know, it's like when you go to Costco, you're not getting any samples anymore because nobody trusts. So that's uh, changing. But a lot of lo locavores have not returned to farmers markets. Instead, they're growing their own and they're going to farm stands. Still, it's a good place to shop. If you find it when you like, it's a good place to shop. Long as you keep in mind how much it may cost, that it will cost more. Uh, it is a great way to get fresh food and other artisanal products. What a uh, uh, farms do that have CSAs is they will deliver a box of fresh food or artisanal products every week. Some will deliver it right to your front door in a cooler. If you have your own cooler, the charge, if you don't have a cooler, they will charge you for a cooler rental. If you have your own cooler, they take it, they fill it. Okay. The food is fresh picked fresh processed. Some farms will even, even take care of milk, cheese, and baked goods. If you're interested, you should shop around, and I have a list for you. Uh, prices can vary. Some farms will charge you 85 bucks a week for that cooler. Other farms will charge you 35. Bayard Cutting Arboretum has a farm, and you can join their CSA or get on the list to join their CSA. The one in Great River, Bayard Cutting Arboretum. If you go into the house, they sell eggs in the house, fresh eggs, because they have chickens. Um, okay, so CSA, um, bring locally grown foods and food products directly to your home. And this is just a sampling. I'm not in favor of any of these. We've tried CSA a few years ago and we found for us, for two people, it didn't pay off. But if we had our daughter still living at home with us and if 
if you know if we'd had two more people in the house it would have definitely been worth it but for two people every week by ourselves we found at the end of the week we just had we always ended up having food left over um so anyway like there's a, like farm to kitchen which is in south hole the good farm delivery in sag harbor rustic roots in uh, hampton bays and the sang lee farms in peconic they all uh, have CSAs and they either deliver to the house or they deliver to a close by place where you can you can pick the stuff up. So we experimented uh, 10 years ago with a CSA delivery service and this was the cooler. And in that cooler, there were seven carrots, five apples, seven potatoes, a cantaloupe, a huge cauliflower, that took us three nights to eat the whole thing. There was a pineapple. We never figured out where the pineapple came from. Two heads of lettuce, fresh basil, 22 asparagus sprigs, and a couple of bok choy. All the food tasted really good and it cooked up just fine, but we thought it was expensive. And so we stopped. But there are locavores that not have stopped. Okay or they would have looked for something that costs less. These days, there are more farms that are doing CSA coolers and the prices have dropped. This was all the food laid out on a table on, on the porch. So you could, you could see uh, that's a lot of food for two people for a week. And that's a lot of money. Um, so, <clears throat> According to the comparison shopping we did with local farm stands and farmers markets and even Whole Foods, because Whole Foods labels where their produce comes from, um, the $85 was double, we figured, what we would have paid at a local market, if, even if we'd gone to a farmer's market. Um, but um, that wasn't the goal. The goal for us that time wasn't to save money, it was to experience freshness, taste, something healthy, something good looking. And you don't wanna forget the pretty. Nobody wants to eat ugly food. Everybody wants their food to look good. I mean, I can, I can remember various times with I remember saying, it's very healthy. And I remember her saying, Mommy doesn't look good. She's an artist, by the way. Of course, she wants everything to look good. But I found in talking to other their kids were this, just as fussy. They want food to look a certain way. So anyway, this is uh, what I did with some of that food. The carrots, um, green beans, the bok choy, uh, tomatoes, and a whole bunch of other stuff. I just sauteed it up with some goat cheese. So is it economical? Farm to table food delivery? No, nah, not so much. But it does, it does save a lot of time because something's delivered to you. It is, does save a lot of gasoline. But we just thought for us, there were not enough people in the household to eat the food to justify the price. So that was my research that uh, on locavores that started 10 years ago at the farmer's market at the Islip Town Hall. Our purchases that day in uh, 2013, I bought carrots, zucchini, yellow squash, tomatoes, peaches, strawberries, and a free range chicken. And I cooked all that food for Sunday dinner. I, uh, that's the menu that I used. I made West African braised chicken, French glazed carrots, steamed zucchini and yellow squash. I made a vegetable lasagna, which simply means you layer. Uh, sliced tomatoes. And uh, I'm sorry, I don't have a picture of dessert. It never made it. We ate the dessert first. Um, which was uh, fresh peaches and strawberries that was uh, served with uh, Greek yogurt. And the Greek yogurt was from a local manufacturer. So um, the last time 
that I did this. I went to the farmer's market in Setauket this past August, and I bought similar, I bought everything similar except two things. There was no free range chicken and um, I didn't get strawberries, I got berries. And I cooked the same recipe and the same thing happened, which is we ate the dessert first. But the food, the food was good and uh, cooked up, cooked up really well. But uh, it worked out all right. I have in my acquaintance locavores who do the CSA and they're very happy with it. But uh, none of these are people who live alone or just two people in the household. They have children or they have a number of people living in the house so that for them, it pays off in the convenience of the delivery and the freshness. Uh, and again, I'm going back to um, Sylvia Macalo, who talked about respecting the farmer and, and how much she uh, cares about supporting the farmers, the local farmers. So my recommendation, make the time, take the trip, go to some farm stands, go to some farmer's markets. You'll really get to see the food that's available. You'll meet the farmers who grow the food. You'll meet the people who make the food. You get to meet other people in the community and you begin to network with them as to where you can buy stuff and, and where you can buy better stuff. And you'll be surprised how much of our food is grown locally, how much of our food is produced locally. You can shop at the local farmer's market or farm stand. Don't be afraid to ask where the food was grown. If you're interested in a local CSA, by all means, try it. Your, your experience may be different than mine, you know. Uh, your experience may vary from mine. Preserve some of the food that you've grown or that you've purchased yourself. The easiest way to preserve your own food is to freeze it. Applesauce, peach sauce, tomato sauce. I mean, slow cookers. Thank you. You know, the easiest way to, uh, to do things like that. One of the things that I like to do is to roast apples. And then, because uh, when you roast apples, uh, what happens is the apples get very soft and just like applesauce and uh, it moves the house at the same time. Uh, you can buy jams and preserves and baked goods, locally roasted coffee from local vendors. Check out some of the restaurants that cook with local food. Also, there's something called a 100 mile Thanksgiving challenge. And what that is, is the challenge of cooking for Thanksgiving using food that was all grown within a hundred miles. And that can be a real challenge. Uh, I like to tell people to visit a farm or buy from a farm stand. And I uh, want to show you some more pictures of the Setauket Farmer's Market, the Islip Farmer's Market, even though it was 10 years ago, with the idea that um, it's, a nice, it's a nice thing to do on a Saturday or a Sunday depending on which one you're going to. According to newspapers and the internet, Suffolk County has 53 farm stands. It has three ranch stands. Ranch stands generally sell meat or pork. It has at least one poultry farm that has a stand and it has a dairy farm uh, that, that sells uh, uh, goat and cheese products. And uh, here are where the farms are. And the farm stands are found. Everything from Amagansett to Yapank. And you notice locally, Amityville, Bayshore, Bayard Cutting, Brentwood. The one in Brentwood, Thera Farm, that's a good size. That's, does anyone here know where the old St. Joseph's Convent is in Brentwood? No? Okay. Well, the Sisters of St. Joseph used to have a convent. And uh, they used to have a convent, a school, and a college in Brentwood, um, just south of Fifth Avenue. And about, I guess it was 15 years ago or so, they sold the school. And um, a, a few years later, Thera Farms began to lease uh, land there that they turned into a farm. So they have a, an organic farm there. Uh, Thera used to go 
back in 2013, Thera used to go to all the farmers markets. Now they don't, they have their own farm stand. Uh, so there's also Center Reach, uh, East Islip, Huntington. I'm just picking the ones that are close by. Um, Ronkonkoma, St. James, Sayville. There are a lot of farm stands on Long Island. And um, I want to close by saying that I have some handouts. Uh, the first handout is a list of uh, local farmers markets. And now I, I limited this to local because I can't see most of us taking a drive to a farmer's market out in Montauk. I just don't see it. So um, I only have a few listed here. Islip, Sayville, St. James, Lake Grove, Port Jeff, and Setauket. Then the second handout is a sampling of area farm stands. And uh, I took this straight from Newsday. Newsday has a magazine they call Feed Me. And uh, it comes out four times a year. It, and it, it's a review of local restaurants. They throw in a few recipes and they, uh, they usually have a center pullout that has a list of specialty restaurants and interviews with, with farmers and restaurateurs. So these are some area farm stands and I tried to limit it to places that would be no more than a 20 minute drive so that it would be close by to. Um, the one that I mentioned at, in Brentwood is uh, Thera Farms. They really have a wide collection of stuff, of food. And then the third, third handout that I have for you. This is a sampling of farm to table restaurants. And what I did was I started, because people travel long distances to restaurants. I started with Aquabog and I ended up in West Sayville. Now, disclaimer. I have not been to all these restaurants. I know it looks like I've been to these restaurants, but I have not been to all of these restaurants. Second, all of these restaurants claim they are farm to table. Are they really? As they say in Spanish, yo no sé. Uh, I wish you all happy eating. Beg your pardon? You know, we don't eat out much because as you saw, I cook. Um, we've been to Tallulah's and the Tula Kitchen in Bayshore. We've, we've been to the Cooperage. Uh, Tallulah's and the Tula Kitchen, that's in Bayshore. The Cooperage is way out in Baiting Hollow. I think, are they still open? They're still open. I'm not, cause I'm like, wait a minute. Uh, I've been to Batatas. Mm, let's see. Uh, the daughter has been to the shed. She said it was pretty good. Tiger Lily and Toast we've been to. The Sweet Soul Bakery in St. James is on my to-go list. And the Country House in Stony Brook. Okay, now this, I only have two because it is many pages, but I will tell you how to, what it is and how to get your own copy. This is the Cornell Cooperative Extension. Cornell Cooperative Extension is your friend. If you, if you have a home, yeah, they've been here. I know we've been, we've been. Uh, they, are, they are your friend. I can remember when we first moved to, to our house, uh, it was 1979 or 1980, I called because I found a strange plant and I wanted to know what it was. And they said, oh, you can just, you can, you know, bring it in and we'll tell you what it is. And I mean, you have to remember, I was teaching at Farmingdale. So I had already gone to the horticulture department and they were like, Mary, we've never seen this before. Call Cornell. 
And I said, what's that? And they told me, whenever you have a, when you, when you have a house, any questions you have, call Cornell. So uh, anyway, at the Cornell Cooperative Extension Suffolk County website, you can get a list of their latest Suffolk County farm stand list. This is from 2018. So it hasn't been, and I mean, these were run off just last week. So they haven't really updated it in, in three or four years, but they very, very nicely provide you with more than just the name and the address. They give you a phone number, they tell you their hours, they tell you what they specialize in. Um, I know for myself, the Catapano Dairy Farm is one of my favorites. I love it. I like the goats. I like watching the goats play. And I love the goat cheese. Their goat cheese is delicious. And remember I was talking about earlier about my childhood. I grew up on goat's milk, not cow's milk. So I have a special fondness for goat cheese and, and, and uh, for goats. They have goats, they have some cheese, uh, um, sheep. They have uh, goat's cheese, goat's milk, all kinds of wonderful products, including soap. If you've never tried soap made with goat's milk, it's very nice for the skin. Uh, and it, it smells, they, it always smells good too. So I know they're good. Um, Song Lee is very good. Um, Thera Farms, they're really good. Now there's a, uh, I'm looking to see if they mention there's a, a place that opened up a while back where they only sell um, meat. I think it's called a hog farm, <laughs> appropriately. Um, I think it's called a hog farm, but I don't know if they have it listed here. But they sell uh, grain-fed meat. Not grain-fed, rather. They sell grass-fed meat. And... Let's see, trying to get the same read. Oh, uh, Schmitz, they have, they, they mentioned the Schmitz Farms. They used to be, I used to stop at the Schmitz Farms in, in uh, Melville and they closed down, but they, there's still the Schneider's Farm Stand. You know, on the way home from work, you stop at the farm stand. The way, the way we would also, when we're coming down 111, we might as well stop at Hirsch, you know, because you never, you know, you never knew what good stuff they'd have. I beg your pardon? Oh, gee, gardeners. No, they mentioned the Garden of Eve, which is a good place to tell a, take a kid to because they have a playground there. No, they don't have that. Oh, no. Oh yes, there is. Yeah, there are some. Up, there are some farms like that that are not typical farms. So I'm going to leave these here, but um, if you, you know, anyone wants them, but you can go to the Cornell site, and once you get to the Cornell site, you can uh, you can you can uh, make your own copy. But it's quite extensive. I thank you so much for coming. I appreciate it. I know we're all busy and I, I appreciate it. Thank you.